Welcome to Baptism, a sign, a symbol, a sacrament. For HSC Studies of Religion 1 and 2 students, studying the topic Christianity Significant Practice. My name is Mr David Ivers and I'm an Education Officer with the Mission and Identity Team at Sydney Catholic Schools. This is the second of three presentations in this series on Baptism for HSC Studies of Religion course. This presentation and the transcript for this presentation will be available from Sydney Catholic Schools via RE Online. This presentation is the second in a series of three presentations. In the first presentation on baptism, we were able to explore HSC syllabus requirements. This presentation will depth the student's knowledge of Christian baptism and analyse baptism in five major Christian variants. The third presentation will summarise key teachings on baptism and baptism in five major Christian variants. If you haven't had a chance to look at the first presentation entitled Baptism, Christianity, Significant Practice, Studies of Religion, Preparing for Study, then make sure you do so once you have worked through this presentation. In that way, you'll ensure that you are doing what the syllabus requires you to do. It's important for your success in the HSC. For example, on the Christian Depth Study, the syllabus is very explicit about what you should be doing in this topic. Quote, the focus of this study is the contribution of significant people, ideas, practices and ethical teachings to an understanding of Christianity as a living religious tradition. The study of Christianity is to be of the whole tradition where applicable." Unquote. This presentation will look at baptism across the whole of Christianity, East and West, with a focus on four Christian variants in Western Christianity, those being Anglican, Baptist, Catholic and United Church. The example of Eastern Christianity that we will look at is the Greek Orthodox variant. In the 2013 HSC Studies of Religion exam, in Section 3, the then New South Wales Board of Studies placed this diagram on the paper. It shows that the understanding that the Studies of Religion syllabus has of Christianity as a living religious tradition is that it is found at the intersection of significant people and ideas, e.g. Paul of Tarsus, significant practice, e.g. baptism, and ethics, e.g. bioethics. You could word that as a question. For example, how does Paul of Tarsus influence our ideas about baptism and how does the writings of Paul of Tarsus and our understanding of baptism as a sign, a symbol and a sacrament influence our understanding of ethics such as bioethics? If you can answer a question like that, you will most likely be showing Christianity as a living religious tradition. There's some homework for you. The syllabus on page 40 asks that you can demonstrate how baptism expresses the beliefs of Christianity and analyse the significance of baptism for both the individual and the Christian community. In other words, the impact of Christianity on the Christian community, such as the variant they belong to, and the impact on the adherent, the believer. If you can do these two things well, you will have gone a long way in addressing the areas required by the syllabus. So we look at baptism as a sign, a symbol and a sacrament with the notation that not all Christian variants will see it as a sacrament. A sign typically points to a present reality and its meaning is usually obvious or self-evident. For example, a speed sign of 60 km per hour means 60, not 80 or 100. A symbol typically has a language of meaning to itself. A candle can be a source of light in a dark room. It can have a further meaning, as at Easter, where it points to the reality of Christ risen. A sacrament is instituted by Christ, and through the reception of the sacrament, the grace of God is received. So baptism is a sign of regeneration. It is a symbol of hope and of the presence of God active in the world. 
It is a sacrament instituted by Christ, as found in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, through which the love and grace of God is received by the individual and the church or variant. As the ritual, baptism existed prior to the establishment of Christianity. Think of John the Baptist baptising in the River Jordan. Ritual baptism involved purification, commitment, conversion. Baptism in Christianity provides a new layer of meaning to what baptism is and perhaps what it isn't. For example, think of the presentation of Jesus in the temple. In the passage from scripture we read, When the days were completed for their purification according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord. Or the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptised by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and yet you are coming to me. Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. So in your HSC exam, you will need a good working definition that covers the whole of Christianity, not just the Catholic or Orthodox Church variants. Mark Reed in 2012 wrote, Baptism is the ordinary rite of initiation by which most Christian churches welcome new members into their faith community. I would add, typically through the use of water and the Trinitarian formula, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St Thomas Aquinas gives this definition of baptism. He says that baptism is the external ablution of the body performed with the prescribed form of words. Later theologians generally distinguished formally between the physical and the metaphysical defining of this sacrament. By the former, they understand the formula expressing the action of ablution and the utterance of the invocation of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. By the latter, the definition sacrament of regeneration or that institution of Christ by which we are reborn to the spiritual life. You may wish to press pause here in order to update your notes. And so now we look at Greek Orthodox baptism background information. According to the Greek Orthodox Church in Australia, the sacrament of baptism was instituted by Christ himself, who, after his resurrection as a farewell commandment and admonition, just before his ascension to heaven, directed these words to his apostles. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all things I have commanded you. From Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Baptism is the gateway into the Christian church. It is the saving action of God, who through water and the Spirit recreates his creation. For the Greek Orthodox variant, it is the initial sacrament through which he who is immersed in water three times in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, is cleansed from all sin and is regenerated spiritually. As our Lord himself stated, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. John chapter 3 verse 5. The baptismal service today contains several components. There are several components to a Greek Orthodox baptism. The renunciation of sin and acceptance of church teaching. This is done by the godparent in infant baptism. The exorcism of evil. The confession of faith. The blessing of the water. The blessing of the oil and the anointing with oil. The immersion three times using the Trinitarian formula. Following baptism comes the sacrament of chrismation. This equates in Western Christianity to confirmation and Eucharist. It includes the tonsure, 
cutting of hair signifying the setting aside for the work of God, the vesting and procession, the readings, bathing the child with the notation that there is no waiting period after baptism, and Holy Communion. According to the Australian Greek Orthodox Church, for at least the next three Sundays after baptism, the godparent will take the child to church to receive Holy Communion, its first taste of the body and blood of the Lord. Just as a mother physically nourishes the newborn infant with milk, so too the grace of God offers a spiritual food, Holy Communion, to its newest member, just born through baptism. Note the role of the godparent in this. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Roman Catholic baptism, a variant within Western Christianity. In this presentation, Catholic baptism is our main case study, though not the only case study of a Christian practice. Whilst there are Eastern Catholic churches, this presentation focuses on the Roman Catholic Church as the largest variant within Western Christianity. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, holy baptism is the basis of the whole Christian life, the gateway to life in the Spirit and the door which gives access to the other sacraments. Through baptism, we are freed from sin and reborn as sons and daughters of God. We become members of Christ, are incorporated into the Church and made sharers in her mission. Baptism is a sacrament of regeneration through water in the Word. It regenerates the newly baptised anew in the spiritual life, an effect on the individual. It also regenerates and gives life to the faith community as they add to their numbers. So who can baptise in the Catholic Church? Some of the students following this presentation may be extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. The word extraordinary should read extraordinary. In other words, you are not the ordinary minister of Holy Communion. The ordained is. The same is true of baptism. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states the ordinary ministers of baptism are the bishop and priest and in the Latin Church also the deacon. In case of necessity, anyone, even a non-baptised person with the required intention can baptise by using the Trinitarian baptismal formula. The intention required is to will to do what the Church does when she baptises. The Church finds the reason for this possibility in the universal saving will of God and the necessity of baptism for salvation. Cases of necessity would include a baby born seriously ill. In this case, the parents may choose to baptise their child themselves. To do so, you pour water three times over the baby's forehead reciting the Trinitarian formula, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The baby is now baptised. Should the baby survive, the rite of baptism would be done in the parish church as a rite of welcome, and the anointing with oil would be done. The part of the ceremony which involves water and the Trinitarian formula would be left out, as that is where baptism occurs, and you can only be baptised once. It is important to note that you have to be baptised into a faith community, a parish. That is why you do not normally find a baptismal font in a chapel, unless that chapel is servicing the needs of a parish. Catholic baptism gives entry to the Church. Baptism gives access to the other sacraments in the Catholic Church. And baptism gives salvation and resurrection. Baptism with this font is conducted by immersion for adults and effusion or pouring when done with infants or children. Note aspersion, which is sprinkling with water, is not normally used in Catholic baptisms. So through baptism we die to sin and are born to new life in Christ. The font in the picture reminds us of a coffin for this reason. The Catholic Church also has the right of Christian initiation of adults. Note that in the Archdiocese of Sydney, the RCIA is for all those seeking to become members of the Catholic Church. Children over the age of seven years and teenagers age seven to 17 
are supported through an adapted form of this rite. Catholic Church has a rite of Christian initiation of adults. This has four periods to it. The first period is the period of evangelization or the pre-catechumenate. The second period is the period of catechumenate or the period of instruction and growth in the faith. The third period is the period of purification and enlightenment. The sacraments of baptism, confirmation and Eucharist are received typically at the Easter Vigil Mass, signifying their dying to sin through the resurrection of Christ. They are now full members of the Catholic Church. The fourth period is the period of mystagogy and the neophyte year. This is the year of accompaniment as they journey through their first year as a baptised Christian. If you would like to extend your understanding of baptism further, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have a series of eight clips on the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. The eighth clip is an introduction to the sacraments and is also worth viewing. The clip on the sacrament of baptism can be found at tinyurl.com forward slash baptize, capital B, Catholic with a capital C, written as one word, baptize Catholic. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Anglican baptism, a variant within Western Christianity. According to the Anglican Church in Glenelg, Victoria, baptism is a rite of Christian initiation. In other words, it is a ritual which celebrates someone becoming a Christian and a member of the Church. Baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime act. By baptising children and babies, we make it clear, as Jesus taught, that all are welcome in God's kingdom. Children are valued and equal members of the body of Christ. Baptism in the Anglican Church is recognised by all other mainline churches and vice versa. This is through a national agreement with all mainline churches. For further information about Christian baptism in the Anglican Church, Google glenelganglican.org.au The Anglican Church has what's known as the Articles of Religion. And despite the different branches or sections of the Anglican Church, sometimes referred to as the Anglican Communion, their understanding of fundamental core aspects of the Anglican variant are found in the 39 Articles of Religion. According to Eleanor Mackenzie, the 39 Articles of Religion, written by Archbishop Cranmer during the reign of Edward VI, 1537 to 1553, was published by the Church of England in 1571, during the reign of Elizabeth I, and is still used today. Article 27 sets out the Church's doctrine on baptism, and Article 25 states the doctrinal belief about the purpose of all the sacraments. It states that the sacraments, including baptism, are not just symbolic acts of faith. God works invisibly through the sacrament to stimulate and strengthen a person's faith. Only two of the church's sacraments are ordained by Jesus in the Bible, baptism and Holy Communion. Ellen Mackenzie also points out that baptism is a sacrament of the Anglican Church. For many Anglicans, it is the first sacrament they receive because they are baptised as infants, but that doesn't mean adults can't be baptised. The doctrine of baptism is set out in the Church's 39 Articles of Religion, and the Liturgy of Baptism is in the Book of Common Prayer. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. Uniting Church Baptism, a variant within Western Christianity. For the student of studies of religion, the Uniting Church stands as an interesting contrast to the practices of the Catholic variant, the Anglican variant, and definitely the Greek Orthodox variant. The Uniting Church has always put an emphasis on scripture, and so to the benefit of the student of studies of religion, you'll find in this presentation on the Uniting Church, the scripture passages that they use to ground their understanding of baptism. In your HSC exam, you will need to be able to quote scripture in support of your analysis of the various variants and their practice of baptism. 
The scripture quotes found here are very useful for that purpose and for gaining insight into the Uniting Church understanding of baptism. You should download their document on baptism from the 1984 General Assembly of the Uniting Church in Australia. You can find the links in the transcript for this presentation. So what is baptism? According to the General Assembly of the Uniting Church, Baptism is a sacrament of Christ's Church. The Lord himself commanded the application of water in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. What does baptism give? According to the General Assembly of the Uniting Church, In baptism, the Holy Spirit conveys the benefits of Christ's redemption. These benefits are the same as those proclaimed by the Gospel and received in faith. According to the New Testament, baptism gives forgiveness of sins in the Acts of the Apostles, justification, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, new birth by which one enters the kingdom of God, John chapter 3, and the letter to Titus in chapter 3. Renewal, again the letter to Titus in chapter 3, verse 5. Adoption as God's children, Paul's letter to Galatians. Incorporation in Christ's body, the church, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. A new garment, Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3. Salvation, first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. And union with Christ in death, burial and resurrection and final glory. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 to 11, and his letter to the Colossians. God in Christ acts both in the church and the world through the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the Holy Spirit is both gift and agent. This is found in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the Acts of the Apostles, and also the Spirit is the seal God promised as a guarantee of the future inheritance. Paul's letter to the Ephesians and Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The Spirit also creates the faith which receives the gift of baptism. This faith is not a product of human decision and commitment. It should be noted that the reception of the Spirit after a lapse of time and subsequent to a Christian baptism without the Spirit, Acts chapter 8, is obviously not the norm. Baptism is the complete act of Christian initiation which requires no supplementary rite or ceremony. Therefore, you do not find confirmation in the Uniting Church. Baptism creates new life. Christians can trace the beginnings of their new life in Christ to their baptism. Paul's letter to the Romans. Baptism nurtures a life of discipleship which begins in baptism and which continues through the life of baptised through instruction in all that Christ has commanded his church to teach. Matthew chapter 28. The people of God are motivated and empowered by their baptism to struggle against sin, to witness in church and world to Christ's resurrection, to love God and their neighbour, to serve, help, encourage and comfort all people, and to do everything else that the new life in Christ involves. People who have been reborn as God's sons and daughters are prompted to live righteously, and members of Christ's body are prompted to use their charismatic gifts for the common good and the edification of all other members of Christ in love. As those who have been enlightened, they shine as lights in this dark world to the glory of God, the Lord of their baptism. For the student of studies of religion, that section there indicates the impact of baptism on the life of the adherent, the believer. If Christians lapse from the faith, and it seems that many do, and the Holy Spirit leads them back again to repentance, they must not be baptised again. Baptism maintains the Christian's status of being joined once and for all to Christ's death burial and resurrection. The very nature of baptism excludes the practice of rebaptism. So what does baptism demonstrate? According to the Uniting Church, baptism 
especially when infants are baptised, demonstrates that Christians are justified by faith apart from human efforts to fulfil what God's law requires. Baptism itself works faith. Also in children who are baptised because they too are part of all nations whom the Lord commissioned the church to baptise. Infants are also part of sinful humanity and need to be reborn, as well as adults, of water and the Spirit. Our Lord clearly regarded this kingdom as received by children, even infants. That's found in Luke chapter 18. What does baptism recall? Baptism recalls three events of salvation history. Christ's baptism in the River Jordan, as found in Mark chapter 1, Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3. The Lord's death on the cross and his resurrection, Luke chapter 12 and Paul's letter to the Colossians and first letter of Peter. And the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, as found in Acts of the Apostles and referenced in John chapter 1. These events teach the baptised that Christ is the head of his body, the Church, and that the baptised people of God receive in the sacrament of baptism a unique participation in the benefits of his life, suffering, death, resurrection and ascension, which includes the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what does baptism demand? Baptism demands that the church remembers the command of Christ as found in Matthew chapter 28 and that water be used. The word baptism requires the use of water. These two aspects, the triune name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and water are essential to every baptism. The quantity of water is of relatively minor importance. Water may be sprinkled or poured or the candidate may be immersed in water. Since the Uniting Church calls and ordains pastors or ministers to proclaim the word of God and to administer the blessed sacraments, it is the practice, except in exceptional circumstances, that those ordained administer baptism. This is consistent with the other Christian churches, including the Catholic Church. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Baptist Church Baptism, a variant in Western Christianity. In the Baptist Church, we talk about the baptism of believers only by immersion. For the Baptists, baptism is an ordinance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a public declaration of a person's faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. In accordance with New Testament scripture, it should be administered only by total immersion, which symbolises the believer's identification with Christ in death, burial and resurrection, the remission of sins and the believer's dedication of himself or herself to God to live and walk in newness of life. So now you have a solid understanding of the background knowledge and theology of baptism in five Christian variants. Greek Orthodox, representing Eastern Christianity, Catholic Church, largest variant in Western Christianity, Anglican Church in Western Christianity, Uniting Church, a variant in Western Christianity, and the Baptist Church, a variant in Western Christianity. Have a look at the next set of slides in this series, HSC Studies of Religion, Baptism, the Significance of the Practice. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. Welcome to Baptism, the Significance of the Practice in Five Variants in Christianity. This is section two of the second part of the series, Christianity, Significant Practice, Baptism. According to Kimberly Logue in her 2016 presentation on Baptism for the Studies of Religion Focus Day conducted by Sydney Catholic Schools, 
Baptism is a significant Christian practice by which a person is welcomed into the Christian community. In mainstream denominations or variants such as the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox, the Anglican, the Presbyterian Methodist, otherwise known as the Uniting Church, for those variants, baptism is a sacrament. In others, such as the Baptist, Pentecostal and the Seventh-day Adventist variants, baptism is a symbolic ceremony. Note, the Salvation Army is a Christian variant. However, they use affirmation of faith in place of baptism. Greek Orthodox baptism, the practice, a variant in Eastern Christianity. There are several components to a Greek Orthodox baptism. The renunciation of sin and acceptance of church teaching. This is done by the godparent in infant baptism. The exorcism of evil. The confession of faith. The blessing of the water. The blessing of the oil and the anointing with oil. The immersion three times using the Trinitarian formula. Following baptism, comes the sacrament of chrismation. This equates in Western Christianity to confirmation and Eucharist. It includes the tonsure, cutting of hair, signifying the setting aside for the work of God, the vesting and procession, the readings, bathing the child, with the notation that there is no waiting period after baptism, and Holy Communion. According to the Australian Greek Orthodox Church, for at least the next three Sundays after the baptism, the godparent will take the child to church to receive Holy Communion, its first taste of the body and blood of the Lord. Just as a mother physically nourishes the newborn infant with milk, so too the grace of God offers as spiritual food Holy Communion to its newest member, just born through baptism. Note the role of the godparent in this. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Roman Catholic baptism, a variant within Western Christianity. In this presentation, Catholic baptism is our main case study, though not the only case study of a Christian practice. Whilst there are Eastern Catholic churches, this presentation focuses on the Roman Catholic Church as the largest variant within Western Christianity. Baptism in the Catholic Church can be quite involved. It includes the reception of the candidate and a liturgy of the word. The child or candidate is received with the celebrant, usually an ordained minister, asking. What name have you given your child? Typically, this would be a saint's name or a biblical name of a righteous person, for example, Daniel. What do you ask of God's church for this person? The celebrant then addresses the parents and the godparents, seeking an undertaking that they will bring the child up to keep God's commandments as Christ taught us, by loving God and neighbour. The celebrant then traces the sign of the cross on the candidate's forehead. The celebration of God's word then follows with readings from scripture and a homily. The prayer of the faithful, the universal prayer, follows. And a litany of the saints is then prayed. Prayer of exorcism and celebration of the sacrament. After the litany of the saints is prayed, the celebrant prays the prayer of exorcism. The prayer of exorcism asks God to free the candidate from original sin and create in them a temple of God's glory. Following the prayer of exorcism, the anointing with the oil of catechumens occurs. This is for health and healing. The celebrant then blesses the baptismal water. The celebrant asks the candidate or parents and godparents, if an infant is being baptised, to renounce sin and make a profession of faith. A baptism with water follows using the Trinitarian formula, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
In the celebration of the sacrament after baptism with water using the Trinitarian formula, the newly baptised is anointed with the oil of chrism as a priest, a prophet and a king. The newly baptised is then clothed in a white garment, a sign of purity. And the newly baptised or the parents and godparents receive a lit candle, usually lit from the paschal candle, as a sign of the light of Christ in the baptised person's life. Being lit from the paschal candle connects baptism back to the Easter mysteries, the resurrection of Jesus. Prior to the concluding rite, the Apatha prayer, to open the ears and mouth of the baptised that they may hear and proclaim the word of God, is prayed. Concluding the rite of baptism. The concluding of the rite, the rite of baptism, finishes with the praying of the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Then part one of a three-part blessing follows. The celebrant blesses the mother holding the child, saying, God the Father, through the Son, the Virgin Mary's child, has brought joy to all Christian mothers as they see the hope of eternal life shine on their children. May he bless the mother of this child. She now thanks God for the gift of her child. May she be one with him or her in thanking him forever in heaven. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Concluding the rite of baptism, we then have part two of a three-part blessing. The celebrant blesses the father of the child. God is the giver of all life, human and divine. May he bless the father of this child. He and his spouse will be the first teachers of their child in the ways of faith. May they also be the best of teachers, bearing witness to the faith by what they say and do. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Concluding the rite of baptism, part three of a three-part blessing then follows. By God's gift through water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn to everlasting life. In his goodness, may he continue to pour out his blessings upon these sons and daughters of his. May he make you always, wherever you may be, faithful members of his holy people. May he send his peace upon all who are gathered here. In Christ Jesus our Lord, Amen. The celebrant then blesses the assembled. May Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you. Amen. This ends the rite of baptism for one child. The language of the blessings tells us that the parents are the first teachers in word and deed, and that the newly baptised is supported by the faith of the community they are baptised into. The three blessings reflects the impact that the baptism has on individuals and on the faith community. The Oil of Catechumens Prior to the baptism with water, the prayer of exorcism is prayed. The Catholic rite of baptism states, Set him or her free from original sin. Make him or her a temple of your glory, and send your Holy Spirit to dwell within him or her. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In 2.15 AD, St. Hippolytus refers to an oil of exorcism used in baptism. In the current rite of baptism, the prayer of exorcism is said and the oil of catechumens is used to anoint the chest, indicating strength and health. We anoint you with the oil of salvation in the name of Christ our Saviour. May he strengthen you with his power, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. Water is a key element in all baptism. Almost all baptism requires the use of water. Water symbolises the cleansing of sin. Water is necessary for life, indicating new life in Christ. Water that flows is referred to as living water in Scripture. This living water brings life-giving grace. Baptism through grace sustains the adherent on their faith journey, with support from the faith community. In the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches, the celebrant anoints the baby on the crown of the head with the oil of chrism. This anointing is to recall how God the Father, through Christ the Son, has freed the child from sin, 
given him or her a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and a welcome into God's family. The oil of chrism. The oil of chrism indicates sanctification. The Catholic rite refers to it as the chrism of salvation. We find in the Old Testament that oil is used to anoint the priests of the temple, the prophets and the kings of the Jewish or the Hebrew people. In baptism, the candidate is anointed as priest, prophet and king. So may you live always as a member of his body, sharing everlasting life. The oil of chrism is also used in confirmation and in holy orders. The white garment. After the baptism by water and the anointing with the oil of chrism, the newly baptised is clothed in a white garment. The Catholic rite of baptism states, You have become a new creation and have clothed yourself in Christ. See in this white garment the outward sign of your Christian dignity. With your family and friends to help you by word and example, bring that dignity unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. Amen. Baptismal candle. After the white garment, the newly baptised is presented with a lit candle. In the Catholic rite of baptism, the prayer at the receiving of the candle states, Parents and godparents, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. This child of yours has been enlightened by Christ. He or she is to walk always as a child of the light. May he or she keep the flame of faith alive in his or her heart. When the Lord comes, may he or she go out to meet him with all the saints in the heavenly kingdom. This reminds us the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This connects to the Easter Vigil and the resurrection of Jesus. The oils, the lit candle, the white garment, all are symbolic of the effect that baptism has on the adherent and the faith community. You may wish to pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Anglican baptism, a variant within Western Christianity. These notes on Anglican baptism are drawn from the Glenelg Anglican Church in Victoria. In Anglican baptism, it is important to ask what do the different parts of the service mean? For example, Baptismal promises. A child is presented for baptism by parents and godparents, sometimes called sponsors. The first responses the parents and godparents make is to accept the responsibility to answer on behalf of the child. Following this, the ancient questions of baptism are asked. Do you turn to Christ? Do you repent of your sins? Do you renounce evil? By answering these questions on behalf of your child, you are affirming your own faith also. You and the godparents then commit yourselves to the great commandment of Jesus, love God and love others, and you love yourself. If the child is of school age, then they can join in and make the promises themselves. Even so, it is a great idea to have the support of godparents and parents making the vows with them as well. What do the different parts of the service mean? For example, the Creed. During the baptism service, the Apostles' Creed is said, This is a statement of Christian belief. It is really in summary form, and so every line is packed with meaning and imagery. All Christians seek to understand what the Creed means for them. The Creed is proclaimed by you, the godparents and the congregation during the baptism service as an affirmation of the whole spectrum of Christian faith within which your child will find a place. What do the different parts of the service mean? For example, the symbols of baptism. Baptism is a richly symbolic act. Water is used as a universal symbol of life. Water symbolises the cleansing from sin and also the pouring over of the Holy Spirit. A shell is used to pour the water, 
which is an ancient symbol of Christian pilgrimage. Oil is used to make the sign of the cross on your child's forehead. This oil, blessed by the Bishop at Easter, symbolises the new life of Christ and the giving of strength. What do the different parts of the service mean? For example, the symbols of baptism. A baptismal candle will be given to your child or you can provide your own. The baptismal candle is lit from the Easter or the Paschal candle, reminding us of the light of Christ. At baptism, a child is called by name. In the early church, followers of Jesus often took on a new name. Saul became Paul, Simon became Peter, Joseph became Barnabas. Thus the expression, Christian name. The naming represents that we are a new person in Christ, known and loved by God. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. Uniting Church Baptism, a variant in Western Christianity. These notes on the Uniting Church Baptism are taken from the 1984 document Baptism by the General Assembly of the Uniting Church in Australia. In the Uniting Church, Baptism takes place in normal circumstances in the presence of the people assembled for worship and our churches provide forms of worship or orders of service for use in congregations. Current liturgies of our churches have the following elements in common. Invocation or a call to worship. Confession and absolution or declaration of forgiveness. Readings from scripture. Affirmation of faith or the creed. An exhortation which includes references to the baptismal command and its promises. And reading of scripture passages relevant to the candidate's baptism and to those who are about to witness the administration of the sacrament. For example, Matthew chapter 28. The minister makes an address to the candidates for baptism which includes the renunciation of evil and the confession of faith on the part of the candidates to be baptised. There's a prayer and or the invocation of the Holy Spirit. There is the baptism with water in the name of the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The sign of the cross, the moment for this differs in the liturgies between the different churches that are amalgamated into the Uniting Church. Various auxiliary acts example the gift of a baptismal candle. And prayers and benediction. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. And so this brings us to Baptist Church Baptism, a variant in Western Christianity. In the Baptist Church, we talk about the baptism of believers only by immersion. For the Baptists, baptism is an ordinance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a public declaration of a person's faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. In accordance with New Testament scripture, it should be administered only by total immersion, which symbolises the believer's identification with Christ in death, burial and resurrection, the remission of sins and the believer's dedication of himself or herself to God to live and walk in newness of life. You may wish to press pause here to update your notes. Baptism, takeaway thoughts, where to from here? Baptism establishes a covenant of love between our triune God, one God, three persons, and the baptised, the adherent. The baptised are strengthened by word and sacrament of God in the Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Presbyterian and Methodist, also known as the Uniting Church, variants within Christianity. For all other variants, it is a symbolic action. Baptism requires the immersion, or pouring, effusion, or sprinkling, aspersion, of water, and the use of the Trinitarian formula, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christians believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Once validly baptised, you cannot rebaptize. Through the waters of baptism, a person becomes a member of the church, part of the Christian tradition. Membership of the church, like the membership of a club or professional organisation, carries both benefits and responsibilities to the member and to the variant or church. Baptism, some further takeaway thoughts. Baptism requires the support of the Christian community, especially the local faith community of a parish. You are baptised into a faith community. The practice of Christianity is therefore not intended to be an individual or private matter. It is always practised in the context of a community of believers. This has been the practice of Christianity dating back to the early church, as seen in Acts chapter 2. All came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And so, baptism requires the support of the Christian community, especially the local faith community of a parish. You are baptised into a faith community. The practice of Christianity is therefore not intended to be an individual or private matter. It is always practised in the context of a community of believers. For this reason, many Christian churches, typically those that see baptism as a sacrament, will baptise infants, children and adults. They recognise that the reception of the sacrament commences a lifelong journey in relationship with God. For the same reason, other Christian churches, typically those that see baptism as a symbolic action, only baptise adults who can attest to their faith in God and their commitment to the faith community they are being baptised into. This is called believer baptism. Types of baptismal practice. Aspersion, the sprinkling of water. Effusion is the pouring of water. And immersion means exactly that, immersion in water. All practices involve the use of the Trinitarian formula. I baptise you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Belief in baptism for salvation. Faith and baptism are necessary for salvation in the Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, and Uniting Church variants. Baptism is not necessary for salvation in the Baptist, Pentecostals, and Lutheran variants. Baptism, the effects on the adherent, fill this requirement. Through baptism, you are born anew in Christ. You share in the mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. You find freedom as a child of God and become a member of the church founded by Jesus Christ. You have responsibility to be an active participant in the faith community including participation in services and liturgies. You have a responsibility to live and announce the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call to discipleship and being countercultural. And of course, the question to ask, what are the responsibility to ethical living? The effect of baptism on the church or the faith community Again, a syllabus requirement. The church is a faith community. Baptism is regenerative. It adds to the membership of the church. They should welcome you as a baptised member. The faith community should journey with you, support you, especially in times of need, celebrate with you and assist in your personal faith and formation. 
There is a cumulative effect in a church having committed members, active in their discipleship of Christ. It creates synergy, where the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts. The church has an obligation to use this talent wisely, consistent with the teachings of the church and of the gospel. That concludes this presentation. Take the time now to consolidate your notes. Good luck.